I'd like to take you back now to when you were a child. What first got you interested in the music? It was I was so lucky. I was so lucky. I, I was born in 1959, so I'm pretty old. I'm almost too old to talk <laughs> these days. Um, and um, and of course that that put me in a place where I was I was I was um, I was growing up listening to the Beatles. Now, mm. you know, the, in in the sixties you couldn't escape the Beatles, but in England it was even you know that was a hundred times more. You know that you're oh, this yourself. Yeah. And so everywhere you went, you, the, the Beatles were there. If you turned on the radio, they were on the radio. You turned on the TV, they were on the TV. You go to the, the sweet shop, they were on the bubblegum wrappers. They were on everything. And um, and I had a huge love of music myself because my father used to play jazz records actually on the mm-hmm. Saturday. Um, but I used to listen to the radio and stuff. And but one of the things that I really remember was one Christmas the BBC broadcast the Beatles live from Shea Stadium because oh, they'd obviously part funded the filming and they wanted to justify to their um, audience and their um, you know the, the people who pay the license fee what, um, what what all that money was spent on <laughs> and I remember seeing them flying over New York and then running onto the stage and all the fans screaming and everything that's and I just funny. thought that sounds like a good place yeah. to be sounds I want to be Paul McCartney in that helicopter <laughs> And, um, and I didn't even know what a bass guitar... I mean, I was probably six or seven. I didn't really know what a bass guitar was, but I just thought it looked cool mm-hmm. and what he was doing was good. And then I've got quite a good musical ear, so I started listening with more attention to Beatles records and realising that actually one of the guitars was just playing the chords mm-hmm. and the other one was kind of doing little riffs and things to enhance the vocals. And the bass guitar was the one keeping the rhythm with the drums mm-hmm. and I thought oh that's an interesting thing to do so yeah. you went straight to bass guitar you didn't know I, guitar no first, I, I learned guitar first because mm-hmm. my sister was having guitar lessons mm-hmm. I wasn't allowed them because I was it was deemed that I was too young this guy called Keith Bakeman they, I'm going to name and shame you now Keith <laughs> no he's a lovely guy actually but but w- when my sister wanted guitar lessons being a young, I was four years younger than my sister so she was about 11 I was about seven I said oh yeah I want guitar lessons too and my parents just thought I was doing it, I want to copy my sister thing. Yeah. But they didn't realise how fanatical I was <laughs> going to become about music. So, and, and this guy, Keith, said, well, you know, at seven, he probably hasn't really got the attention span. I don't think the lessons, you know, I think you'd be kind of throwing your money away, really. Because I don't think he'd really, you know, stick to it. Most, most kids of that age wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so my sister had guitar lessons and she wasn't really getting on with it very well. And I'd pick up the guitar. She'd be, she'd be, it'd be frustrating, and it'd be frustrating my parents even more. You can imagine. <laughs> and I'd pick up the guitar and show her what it was she was trying to do, because I could hear, I could hear what it was that she was supposed to be trying to do, and, and I could work out on the guitar yeah. where, where she was playing a note that, that wasn't was slightly flat. I mm-hmm. could tell, you know, yeah, but you've got a note wrong there. It should be there. And so my parents said, Oh, actually, maybe he should have guitar lessons then. Mm-hmm. And so I had a few guitar lessons. And it was really just to show me some chords and stuff. Mm-hmm. And my best friend, and we were both seven at the time actually, my best friend was having guitar lessons uh, from him as well. And we've stayed friends ever since. We formed loads of bands. And we're both in the music business. Whereabouts was that when you were? That was in Aylesbury. Mm-hmm. That was in Aylesbury. And um, if you're familiar with a guy called Howard Jones, oh, yes. um, Robin, my friend Robin Bolt uh, plays guitar with mm-hmm. Howard Jones now. Mm-hmm. But he used to play with Fish for a while. Yes. And then he became a session guitarist and did stuff on Spice Girls and mm-hmm. all kinds of albums. And certain albums he probably wouldn't want to know <laughs> about, actually. <laughs> yeah, I don't always like the name on the, these records, you know, but it pays the bills. The same, yeah. <laughs> so when did you... But, um, yeah, oh, well, so that was my... first guitar? I got my first... Well, uh, we, we had this acoustic guitar, which was kind of became mine because my sister got angry about not, not being as good as me. I can appreciate that <laughs> now. I uh, couldn't at the time. Um, but I got my first guitar. It was a second-hand Vox. It was a white Vox guitar. It wasn't a teardrop, but it was a white Vox guitar in a kind of style of a... Um, style of a Strat, I suppose. Right. And, and of course, you know, to me, because it was second-hand and everything, and to me it was just like, well, it's not a proper guitar because it's not a Fender or anything. Yeah. But I guess it was about 30,000 or something. But then I, f- I, I, then I had another guitar called a Framus, which was red, and had three pickups, and it had three kind of toggle switches, <laughs> and um, and then I sold that, 
I don't know really how that happened, but I must have sold that, and I bought a brand new bass guitar from Percy Prize in Wickham. No. And I was about 12 years old, and I realised that my my friend Robin was really coming becoming much much better than I was on the guitar. I could play the chords and everything, and I was really good at keeping time. And he was doing all. We used to mess about with Django Reinhardt stuff and you know jazzy stuff because it was kind of what you could pick up yeah. and play. Um, so anyway, we decided to form a band. You know, every it was all about garage bands in those days, and that really was bands that played in garages. That <laughs> wasn't about being a an indie kind of movement of music. Mm -hmm. um, and we needed a bass player, so I decided to be the bass player, and I bought my first bass guitar. And it was twenty-one pounds, brand new. And I think I had to say, but I think I had money for Christmas, and my birthday's in January, so I had money for Christmas and money for my birthday. And my parents were saying, "Are you like twelve years old?" And I said, "Are you sure you want to do that? Because you'll have nothing to open on Christmas Day. You, are you, do you really want to put yourself <laughs> through that? You know, we can give you an envelope with all the money, and so you can see it." And you know, and I said, "Yeah." Pretty good investment in hindsight. Well, it was it was a horrible guitar actually, <laughs> and then I bought a white. Then after that, I bought um, a white um, kind of SG copy, mm. well EB3 copy. I now know. At the time, I thought it was an SG copy, um, and that was a bit better. And then, um, and then I became a poor student, and um, and I had absolutely no money and a really shitty guitar, and. Um, we had a, a, a music, two, two guys came into town and started running a music store called Free and Easy. Mm -hmm. And as a promotion for, to, get, to get to people in the area to get to know them, they did a raffle and the first prize was a guitar. Well. And um, they kind of organised it that I'd win. <laughs> so um, I chose a bass guitar. I managed to get a Fender bass guitar. So um, I, really, um, I really appreciate what they did actually. Well, it was great actually. It was it was it was um, it was um, amazing to to to, um, to be given that support really. Mm -hmm. And then when you first started playing in bands, what type of music were you listening to apart from the Beatles, who were an influence? Well, I started off in um, in a band. I mean, I was in bands at school, and we kind of, we did kind of Hawkwindy, riffy stuff. We just used to do a lot of stuff based on E, mm -hmm. and then a lot of stuff that was based on E, D, and C, which is a, just a basic rundown because it was easy to play and uh, and then when we start when, when, I, when I actually got into a serious band I was in a band called Orthy and another good friend of mine called Stephen Foe was a year older than us and he was um, he was a violinist nice. he was a very serious musician and he used to kind of write all these they were kind of like progressive songs so they were slightly folky mm -hmm. but they were very progressive as well and Orthy I guess sounded a little bit like Meridian do mm -hmm. actually and we used to go and do gigs. We actually did a few gigs in London, but I mean, I was, I was 17 at the time, so I wasn't really allowed to play. We used to play pubs and clubs, but I wasn't supposed to be yeah. there really. But um, and, and Robin and myself weren't were really allowed in there because we weren't 18. But they used to sort of sneak us in the back, and mm -hmm. we used to play. And um, we became kind of, well, in the local area, we became like the band to, mm -hmm. to go and watch, and we. Um, that kind of changed, people left the band and that became a bit more of a mainstream rock band and then punk happened mm -hmm. so we started doing um, we started doing things like um, Dr Feelgood songs and you know stuff that was... It was a big was pub rock scene at the time wasn't it? Massive pub rock scene with, um, with the band that ended up being just Dire Straits actually mm -hmm. um, and then then that band, I ch then that band kind of split up, and I joined with some friends of mine from another band, and for, we we formed a band that called that we eventually was called the Metros, and we made an EP. We sold the EP and made enough money to buy tickets to America. So we went, we flew to New York and lived in New York for three months, um, trying to make it. And of course we didn't. But the one thing we did do while we were there was support Duran Duran. Uh, on one of the shows on their first US tour and they turned up I mean they were in limos because they're the record company but they turned up in this club and they literally just had amplifiers and guitars wow. they had no, there was nothing else and a keyboard and yeah. they sounded and they did I tell you what the album they did the first album and it sounded note perfect yeah. I mean I, I, you know I, I, I understand a lot of people have suspicions about 
pop bands yeah, yeah. and think, oh, they can't really do it, they don't know what they're talking about. But they were great mm-hmm. the night I saw them, and it was just a shitty little club, no backup at all, and they really put a lot of effort into Maybe it. Into it right, yeah. yeah. But then, of course, they turned up in this limo, immaculately dressed, and left as soon as the, the gig was over. They wouldn't even... Our, our drummer, because you can imagine, you know, I, we, Duran Duran were a big deal in England. Big at the time, time. And our yeah. drummer had a... Um, well, the drummer and the singer were brothers, and they had a young si- sister who was absolutely in love with, with John Taylor, as most girls were in those days. And uh, our, our drummer asked if he could have a photo. Mm-hmm. And, and he said, no, no, we're, right. we're going now, which I thought was a bit... Yeah, a bit off. I've, so, I've, I've met John Taylor later on in life with Marillion, and he's a, he's a much more relaxed, cool guy, yeah. I think. So that was kind of... And then I came back, so digressing, I was in America... I was probably 21 at the time. I'd left my job. I had a TV. I was repairing TVs during the daytime. But that wasn't a serious job. It was just a way of earning enough money to keep myself in bass strings and, and valves from the yeah. bass amp. Um, and then I gave him a job and we went to America, came back from America, and had that talk with my dad about my dad saying, Well, you know, son. What are you going to do with yeah, it? Get a proper and job. I said, yeah, exactly. He was really cool about it because he had been forced to go into law right. and he wanted to be. He was an incredible pianist, my dad. Right. And he, I mean, I didn't realise but um, until later on how good he was. But when I was a kid, he'd you'd be able to play Oscar Peterson. Mm. Note perfect. And I just thought, oh, I guess dads can do that then because, you know, <laughs> I didn't know any better. And uh, I didn't only realise now how amazing he was on the piano. Yeah. So... Uh, so that's probably where I get it all from. So my dad was sat me down and I said, well, I really want to try and do this. He said, yeah, but he said, you know, you can waste your life away trying to do this. What, what do you think the child, do you think you're seriously, you know, do you think you can really do this? Do you think you've, and I said, well, I've got to give it a shot. He said, well, I can, I can see where, I can see that. I said, I'll tell you what, I said, I'll, I'll give it till I'm 25. And if I'm at 25, I haven't got anywhere, I'll give it up mm-hmm. and do something else. He said, yeah, okay then. And um, and then a few months later, I, I joined Marillion. And yeah. the, as they say, the rest, the rest is, history. is history. Yeah. And then six months after that, we signed to... Having been turned down by every record label, once I joined the band, we got signed. So I used to joke, you know, when, <laughs> when, you. When, when, when things got a bit heated, <laughs> I used to joke that I was the reason why they got signed. <laughs> well, don't forget, I was the reason... Because I was the new boy, so I got all the butt of all the jokes on right. the first tour I was on. 